So now we're going to look at a new uh, hypothesis class. Apply both maximum likelihood and uh, maximum opposite criterion and see what kind of objectives we get. So we've seen linear model. We've seen the idea of learning as loss minimization. And we've seen uh, this Bayesian uh, estimation criteria. Logistic regression combines all three of these. You can introduce logistic regression as, and I'm about to do it now, as a Bayesian approach. You can introduce logistic regression purely as a loss minimization approach, and these two are going to be equivalent. Uh, we look at logistic regression for the new hypothesis class. So any new hypothesis class, you need to know what it is functionally, how to make predictions, and such things. And then we have to think about how learning works. So we look at training a logistic regression classifier. And then I'll just like I did with linear regression, I'll connect it back to loss minimization. Let's uh, start off by looking at logistic regression. We're back to classification now. Um, our inputs are d-dimensional vectors, and our features, uh, which represent the features, and our labels are minus one or one. So we have a binary classification problem. We, we are assuming that we have a training set, S, consisting of uh, M examples, Xi, the, the feature vector Xi that's paired with the ground truth label, Yi. Our goal is to find a classifier that uh, mimics um, the process that labels these examples. We seek to find a classifier. And what we've done so far in the entire semester is if my goal is to find a classifier, we want to search over the space of functions that can produce a minus one or a plus one. But instead of taking that search space, instead of considering functions that can produce a minus one or a plus one, let's change the game slightly. Instead, let's consider the problem of predicting the probability that the label is plus one given the example. Okay. This is uh, from the perspective of our what we've seen in the class so far. What we are doing is we are changing the hypothesis space. Originally, the hypothesis space consisted of functions whose domain was the, in, the, the in, input space and the range was the label space. Now, the domain remains the same and the range is a number between zero and one representing this particular probability. It's a number between zero and one, so we are converting, we need to predict the real number, so we are, make, we, we are dealing with a regression problem. Even in this, of course, there are many hypothesis cases possible. But before we talk about a reasonable choice for a hypothesis space with this condition, any questions? We are learning a function that produces a probability. We are not learning a function that directly produces a label, but it produces a probability. Yeah. Because it should be a probability. We want to produce this function. The probability is also a function, right? The function that takes the input x and produces a number between 0 and 1, and you're going to interpret that number as the probability of y equals 1. And if training works out nicely, we will actually have that function. So we're changing the definition of the problem here slightly. It turns out one of the most popular um, uh, hypothesis spaces for this particular setting where we need to produce a probability distribution over uh, a single bit is involves something called the sigmoid function. And this is in terms of the hypothesis space for the logistic regression classifier. The, 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 sigma, the, the hypothesis space is parameterized by a weight vector, W, and it takes an example and it applies, it, the, the, it applies the dot product between W and the example X, so that's W transpose X, 
Remember, W transpose X is a number. And then it applies the sigmoid transformation to the number. Um, there's a question. Why is it RD when we are looking at only one probability? RD is just the, uh, the input space or the instance space and the probability is over the label space. So this expression here is simply saying we are looking at functions that can take your input in the d-dimensional input to a single number that represents the probability. In particular, the probability is going to be, they're going to define the probability as the sigmoid applied to W transpose X. The sigmoid function is simply, um, uh, sometimes it's called the logistic function. There are many different functions called the sigmoid, it's sigmoids. But usually when people say sigmoid, they mean exactly this. Uh, the sigmoid is a function that takes a real number and converts it and flattens it into a range zero to one by applying one over this transformation, one over one plus e power minus z. This is a reasonable choice and we'll see why this is a reasonable choice later. Uh, the, it, it's important to think of no, uh, almost instinctively, I. You can think about what is the domain and the range of the sigmoid function. It can take any real number. When z, that real number z, is infinity, positive infinity, you get 1 over 1 plus e power negative infinity. e power negative infinity is nothing but 0. So when z is equal to infinity, you get 1. So this term vanishes when z is infinity. When z is negative infinity, you get 1 over 1 plus e power plus yeah. infinity. So this becomes, this goes up to infinite. So this whole thing goes down to 0. So that's those are just the extremes. And uh, if you stare at this function, the plot of this, which I'll show you in a minute, it turns out this is an increasing function. You can take the second derivative of this and you'll find that this is, uh, or the derivative of this is positive. So the, this is an increasing function. At one extreme, it's at zero. The other extreme, it's at one. It basically looks like this curve here. Sigmoid usually refer to all S-shaped functions, but increasingly in the context of machine learning, when people say sigmoid, they just mean this one thing. Uh, this should be sigmoid of X. They just mean sigma uh, this particular uh, function, 1 over 1 plus e power minus z. And notice that as z increases, it gets increasingly closer to 1. Very, very quickly, as z decreases, it gets increasingly closer to 0 very, very quickly. At z equals 0, e power 0 equals 1. And so you get exactly the sigmoid at sigmoid of zero is exactly half. This is just a function. How many people have seen the sigmoid before? Uh, some subset of you. If you've not seen it before, this is a function that keeps coming up all the time in the Um It's a natural sort of a thing that, is, that you, you should think of whenever you have a real number and you want to convert it into a number between zero and one to represent a probability. Yes. In this case, yeah, um, it's, it's one dimensional. If you have multiple dimensions, you can apply sigmoids independently. Sigmoid is very well studied. Um, uh, its mathematical properties are well understood. Uh, one useful thing to think about, because it might also be helpful for your homework, is to consider what's the derivative of the sigmoid function. So what's the derivative of uh, this is not a partial derivative. It's just a function that maps a number to a number. I'm not going to work through the detail, but it's not terribly hard to show that the derivative of a sigmoid at any point z is simply the sigmoid multiplied with one minus the sigmoid. Um, you can you can stare at it and convince yourself this is correct. Another interesting property here is if sigmoid of z is this quantity. What is sigmoid of minus z? Uh, 
That's nothing but 1 over 1 plus e power z. Right? Let's say I multiply and divide both sides by e power z. So I multiply e power minus z. Let's say. So this gives me e power minus z divided by yes. But this quantity is nothing but 1 minus, which is 1 minus sigma z. This is kind of cool. Um, I don't know if it's particularly useful, but it's uh, a neat property. The other thing to note here is when we are in our uh, assumption here, we are assuming that the probability this quantity is nothing but probability of y equals 1 given x. If the probability of y equals 1 given x is a sigmoid, then the probability of y not equal to 1 is 1 minus the sigmoid. When y is not equal to 1, it's equal to minus 1. So probability of y equals minus 1 given x is 1 minus sigmoid of whatever. Okay, and I'm just listing out properties of sigmoids, uh, uh, and like all lists, they tend to be boring. Any questions about the sigmoid function itself? Let's go back to predicting probability. So, according to the logistic regression, the probability that y equals one given x. And W, because uh, we, we know that the model is W, let's say, is sigmoid of W transpose X, which is 1 over 1 plus e power minus W transpose X. The probability of predicting minus 1 is 1 minus the sigmoid, which is, as we just saw, it's exactly this quantity here. Convince yourself that adding this and this together gives you 1. Right? But Let's uh, let me reorganize the, the last expression by multiplying and dividing by e power w transpose x. In the numerator, these two together multiply to give you one, and in the denominator, you have one plus e power. W transpose x. This is interesting. When I want to predict the probability of plus 1, I have 1 over 1 plus e power minus W transpose x. When I want to predict the probability of minus 1, I have 1 over 1 plus e power plus W transpose x. So I can put them together, and this is exactly that quantity there. And I can put them together, I can say that P of Y given X over W is nothing but 1 over 1 plus E power minus Y times W times X. And both these terms uh, show up. I've done nothing here other than just move symbols around. There's nothing sort of intellectually difficult, it's just literal algebra. Any questions about what, uh, what we've seen so far? <laughs> A sort of an anecdotal or a sort of an incidental note here. I'm explicitly modeling P of Y given X, which is called the conditional probability, which is a conditional probability of the label given the input. It turns out there are other classes of models where rather than modeling P of Y given X, I could have instead indirectly modeled P of X given Y and P of Y and applied Bayes rule to get P of X. Mm -hmm. P of y given x, sorry. Given those two highlighted things, I can compute P of y given x. Mm -hmm. I could have done that. Logistic regression in particular does not do that. Um, there is a family of models very closely tied to logistic regression, which do actually compute P of x given y and P of y, 
And that is the naive base classifier, which as I said last week, we don't have time to cover. But the naive base and logistic regression are very, very closely tied to each other. The big difference being logistic regression directly computes P of Y given X. Naive base indirectly computes it by modeling P of X given Y and P of Y. Um, we're not going to go into the details of naive base, but this is just a um, sort of trivia. But let's go back to this question of modeling probability. So in the beginning, I said, our goal is to predict the label. The label can either be plus one or minus one. And then I said, I would like to predict the label, but instead let me convert it into a real a regression problem by making my, you know, may, uh, asking that I should predict, uh, the, the system should predict a probability that the label is something. But I still care about the label. When I'm deploying this classifier, I don't really care about the probability of the label. I care about the label itself because we need to, sometimes we may have to use the classifier and it helps us make a decision. So how do we convert, a, if you had a box that gives, that gives you probabilities, how would you convert it into a decision? What's an easy answer? Uh, it isn't half power. Yeah. So if the probability of one is greater than half, probability of one given X is more than half, then you just say the label is one. The probability of one given X is less than half. That means this other term should of course be more than half. So the label is minus one. So that's going to be our decision rule. And your decision rule essentially says you compute the probability and you threshold it at half. And if P of Y equals one given X is more than half, then you predict plus one. Otherwise you predict minus one. Let's uh, write that down here. So the predict plus one if P of Y equals plus one given X, I'm ignoring the W there is greater than or equal to half. But I know the expression for P of Y equals one, that's exactly this quantity there, so I can plug that in. So if one over one plus E power minus W transport X is greater than or equal to half. Let's go to a new page and So my prediction rule says predict plus one if p of y equals one given x is greater than equal to half or equivalently if one over one plus e power minus w plus plus x is greater than equal to half. I can reorganize this and make this a rule that is purely just that's in terms of W transpose X directly. So let's work on that. That is this IE is one plus E power minus W transpose X is less than equal to two. I just took the inverse of both these things. I can subtract one on both sides. So I get E power minus W transpose X is less than equal to one. I can take log on both sides. Minus W transpose X is less than equal to zero, or equivalently, if W transpose X is greater than equal to zero. So let's see what's going on. I want to predict one if W transpose X is greater than equal to zero. We've seen this before, right? Any linear classifier, any linear classifier predicts one if W transpose X is greater than equal to zero. It turns out logistic regression does the same thing, except it has a great probabilistic interpretation. Logistic regression is just a linear classifier where the dot product of the weight with the example, which I'm just going to call the score, the score is passed through the squashing function, the sigmoid, to get a probability. You could have thresholded the probability at any level. A reasonable choice is half. If the probability is more than half, you predict one. And if you take that decision rule and apply it and you know work it through, turns out we get back the exact same decision rule that we had for perceptron, that we had for SVM, that we had for any linear classifier. 
logistic regression is also a linear classifier. Any questions about this? Yes. It could be. Uh, there, there, there are many, many reasons for changing a threshold. One might be, for example, what you said. Let's say one label was always more frequent than the other, and you believe that your model has learned an unnecessary preference for that label. So you could change your threshold so that it rebalances things. You could do that. Or another example, another uh, thing could be, uh, you could predict one, let's instead of a threshold of a half, let's say you could predict one, if uh, y equals, the probability of y equals one is more than 90%. You predict minus one, if it is less than 10%. There's this gap between you know the 10 and 90, you refuse to make a prediction. That's another way of, you know, this is a, just a, a, a choice that you can have as a design. What I just described, where you make a prediction only if the model is very, very confident on either label, is a, you can think of it as a mechanism for introducing safety. You don't want your automated system to make a decision unless it's extremely certain, where the probability denotes the uncertainty in the way. Another, another possibility is, uh, um, you, or actually, let, let me give you an example where this uh, makes sense. So let's say that uh, you have a self-driving car and for some reason it's a logistic regression that's controlling whether uh, the, uh, the brakes should be pressed or not. Seems like a terrible idea, but let's say it works. There are two possible actors, either you press the brake or you raise the brake. Or you give it to the human controller. And you could say the middle region is where you give it to the human controller. Another possibility is you want your model to predict one label only if it's very, very certain. And otherwise, it defaults to the other label. So predict label equals plus one if and only if the, the probability of one is more than 90%. So this can you can you can imagine examples in say medical diagnosis where one um, uh, one uh, side of a decision is far more impactful than the other. On one side, it might involve something life threatening. On the other side, it few extra tests. So the uh, the risk of choose making a mistake on one side is very different, and that's the place where these sorts of things become helpful. It turns out all of that corresponds using exactly a similar sort of a. Um, uh, you know, similar sequence of steps, any threshold that you place here translates to a threshold here. It's just it's basically the same idea. In the probability space, we can ask what we want our model to be very certain or uncertain. In the dot product space, it corresponds to distance from the hyperplane. If your if your point is such that it's very, very far from the hyperplane on one side, then it turns out W transpose X will be pretty high or very, very negative or very, very positive. The model is very certain. So these two things are just, once again, two different perspectives to look at the exact same uh, concept. So because this kind of works like you know, wrong, you have the same guarantee, but it's maybe the second more No, so that's an interesting question. Perceptron that algorithm applied to a hypothesis space. The perceptron algorithm comes with a guarantee, not the hypothesis space. For instance, if your underlying uh, data set is not linearly separable, no learning algorithm can actually find a classifier that works. In this case, it turns out with logistic regression, the learning algorithm that we will build for logis logistic regression will end up also having a guarantee that it will find a classifier if one exists. It's not the same kind of a guarantee that we saw before in the sense that it's not this, uh, it's not a convergence proof uh, that is mechanical like the perceptron, but more from the optimization point of view. Because we'll build up, we'll end up building a loss function. And if the data set is linearly separable, then the loss can become really, really small. That's how it will work. Okay. So, The decision rule for logistic regression is if you have no reason to believe that the threshold for probability should be anything but half, uh, 
prediction with logistic regression is nothing but the sign of a Bipartial X, which is cool because you can be training a model with logistic regression. You can be using your exact code, the same code that you have for testing for Cetron for testing your logistic regression because eventually you just have a weight vector. You can use the same code for logistic regression, for perceptron, for SPM, because all of those are just linear classifiers where predict the prediction rule is identical, which is why it makes sense, for instance, for your homework, for me to solve logistic regression and perceptron uh, SEM as one um, uh, as one question. Really. Okay, there are 15 minutes left, and I'm planning to at least cover maximum likelihood estimation for logistic regression in those 15 minutes. And if time permits, we'll talk about how we can add priors. And when we add priors, we get maximum a posteriori estimation, which it turns out will end up looking a lot like some problems we've already seen before. Let's uh, start off with maximum likelihood estimation. Our goal is uh, to find a classifier, a weight vector W, that uh, mimics the, that uh, uh, best classifies a data set. The data set consists of labeled pairs, xi and yi, where yi is the label, for the example, xi. And remember, the maximum likelihood estimation criterion is nothing but find a model, in this case, a weight vector, such that the likelihood of the data given the model is maximized. So, we make the usual assumption. We assume that our data is uh, drawn IID. Um, so uh, what do we do now? How do we proceed? Yeah. All maximum likelihood estimation essentially proceeds with the same sequence of steps. We need to maximize this quantity here. Mm -hmm. To maximize that quantity there, let's actually write down that quantity. Our data is IID, which means each example is independent of all the other examples. So I can write down the likelihood of the data as simply the product of the label probabilities for each example. Right? This S is just to kind of remind you, this S is nothing but XI and YI which consists of M examples. And that's exactly the M examples over which we've taken the product. Each example is independent of all the others. That's why this uh, product works. We need to maximize a large product. We're back to the same thing that we saw before. We need to maximize a large product. Products are not fun to work with. Let's take the log and make it a sum. So equivalently, instead of maximizing the product, we can maximize the sum of the log probabilities. Yeah? I'll pause here if there are any questions. And from here, it's just, it's almost smooth sailing because our goal is to maximize that quantity, the sum of the the log probability of the label given the example. What does the logistic regression classifier give us? It gives you the probability of a label given the example. In particular, we know that by definition, P of yi given w comma xi is nothing but the sigmoid applied to yi times w transpose xi. By the way, notice how I snuck in yi times w transpose xi once again. That quantity came up in perceptron. That quantity came up in SVM. Now it's back in logistic regression. So our goal, uh, so we have the probability of, for this particular example, xi, yi, the probability that the label is whatever yi it was assigned, according to this model, is 1 over 1 plus e power minus y w transpose x. I want to take the the log of that quantity because that's what we have here. So log of P of yi given is 
the log of this quantity, log of one over something is nothing but negative log of that thing. Okay. So I can, wow, that looks so bad. Let me rewrite that and try to be clearer. Hopefully that's a little bit more less. Okay. Now life is good because you can just plug that quantity in there. So let's do that. Maximize over all the weight vectors. Um, the sum over negative log one plus e power minus y w transpose x. I can pull the minus outside, and uh, so we get maximize negative sum of this quantity there. Maximizing the negative of something is the same as minimizing the thing. So I can now say this is equivalent to minimizing the negative, uh, minimizing the sum over log of 1 plus e power minus y w transpose x. Let's uh, step back and see where how we started and where we are. Our goal is find the maximum likelihood estimate for a probabilistic classifier. In particular, this class of models, we are called discriminative models because discriminative models explicitly produce, produce the label given an example. We haven't seen that terminal, the terminology uh, before, uh, but logistic regression is a discriminative model. Our goal is to find, is to do perform maximum likelihood training of this discriminative classifier under the logistic model. Um, uh, the, the, for the posterior distribution of the label. So it's everything that we've done, this sentence basically describes our original goal. We need to find the maximum likelihood estimate of the logistic model. What we ended up with is minimizing this quantity there. Maximizing the likelihood is not is equivalent to solving this minimization problem. Let's share it with minimization problem. Is the sum over each example of some quantity here, log of 1 plus e power minus y w transpose x. That expression that doubly highlighted on the slide right now is called the logistic loss. The maximum likelihood estimation problem that we started off with is mathematically equal to training a linear classifier where mistakes of the classifier are penalized according to something called the logistic loss. We've seen the hinge loss before. The hinge loss showed up in the case with perceptron, with, with SVM, sorry. We've seen the perceptron loss. I kind of flashed it briefly uh, at the end of the SVM line. This is not a loss. It behaves the same way. It penalizes mistakes. We'll see a plot of it later on. Any questions about it? Yes. Mostly because R is uh, painful to keep typing. Um, and it, yeah, that's that really what. And I was careful with what I wrote because. Uh, I did not say that they are equal, but they are equal. solving that optimization problem is equivalent to solving this problem. Yeah, I, I, I remember thinking that and making a choice. It's the weight vector. The weight vector that maximizes that quantity is the R max. Max is simply the maximum value of that function. Max is the maximum value of, if I say max or min of this, it gives me the value of that function at the maximum. The argmax gives me the weight vector that takes it to the maximum or the minimum. 
Other question? Looks like we have some time. So I'm going to actually uh, continue on with uh, adding priors. We could add priors to the way. And this is kind of cool. Suppose each element of the weight vector, so the weight vector consists of D numbers, right? Suppose each element of the weight vector came from a Gaussian distribution um, with zero mean and some standard deviation sigma. Let's say this is our belief about the, the weight. This is how nature fits its weight vector. I don't know why. Well, there's a good reason why. If, uh, if we had no data whatsoever, what is the weight vector that maximizes this distribution? What is, if I have a normal distribution that is centered around zero, it has a, wow, that's a, if I have a normal distribution that's centered at zero, the probability is maximized at zero, right? The, the normal distribution attains its higher, highest value at zero. So this is essentially saying, in the absence of any information, the most probable weights are the zero value. Push the weights to zero if there is no reason to keep it anything but zero. That's what happens if you just try to maximize the prior distribution. So we get we can use define this prior, and I've just written the normal distribution here. And now in the five minutes that are left, we can quickly derive map estimation for logistic regressions. We have the prior. And we can work through the same process once again. We've already done maximum likelihood estimation. Um, that's the same thing that uh, we saw before. And keeping that on the side, let's use that to work out map the map objective. The goal of map estimation is to maximize the posterior probability of the model given the data. So it's to, it's to maximize the of W given S in this case which is equivalent to saying, I want to maximize the product of the likelihood P of S given W and P of W. So once again, uh, stepping through this one step at a time, the R max of P of W given S is the same as R max of P of S given W times um, P of uh, W. Let's just already take logs. So we are maximizing the sum of the log likelihood P of S given W and the log prior P of log P of W. I've just taken the log of this product here. But the good news is that first term there, the log likelihood is exactly the same as this thing here. We literally just wrote down the whole expression for log likelihood. So we can literally just copy this and put it here. So that part is easy. Let's focus on the log prior. The log prior, the P of W term, is a product over each weight element, right? It's product over each feature, each dimension. I'm indexing them by J here. Uh, from what J goes from one to D of this uh, expression there. When I take the log, I'm left with the sum sum over each feature or each dimension. So I can write that, but the sum of what? The sum of the log of that quantity. Log of this is, notice that log of one over sigma root two pi does not depend on W. So I'm just putting that into this constant here. And the log of e power minus W cross W i square divided by sigma square is nothing but minus W i square divided by sigma square. At this point, I have a lot of uh, moving parts on the slide. So I encourage you to work this out offline as well, just to convince yourself that I'm not lying to you. Or maybe there's a typo on the slide and maybe you can try to find it. Our goal is still to maximize this whole thing so we can get rid of all the constants. We don't, it doesn't really matter. So we are left with these two terms to maximize. Both the things in the summation have a minus, but more importantly, let's stare at this quantity there. I'm summing over J from one to D of 
W or I from, okay, there is a typo, this should have been an I. And summing over I from one to Z of W I square divided by sigma square. So it is W one square plus W two square plus and so on till W B square. The whole thing divided by sigma square, there's a minus. But this thing here, W is a number, right? And there are D of them, so you have a weight vector. That thing at the bottom that I've highlighted is nothing but W transpose W. It's the dot product of the weight with itself. It's the square norm. So I can use that to clean things up. So I get max of the first thing that we saw, the logistic loss, negative logistic loss, and minus one over sigma square W transpose W. Maximizing a negative function is nothing but minimizing the positive version of it. So I get this expression. Does this look familiar? Yes. Why? Let me pull that up on top. Why does this look familiar? Does it? Is it SPM? You said yes, but you didn't say why. Exactly. It's a regularizer. What started off as a prior in the Bayesian sense has now become a regularizer from the loss minimization perspective. We still have a loss. So we have we have a loss function, the logistic loss, and we have a regularizer. And once again, this is just like with the least mean square, this is a different origin story for the regularizer. On the SVM side of things, we said a regularizer maximizes the margin. The logistic regression side of things, we are saying that the regularizer is actually a prior that imposes a preference for your weight to come from a normal distribution in the absence of any data. We are at time. I'll stop here. I want you to note that you can write down the stochastic gradient descent algorithm for this. I say you can, but actually homework six asks you to do it. So you better do it. Um, and it will look, it won't look very much like the SVM, but it will have the same structure where the only different part is the gradient. Uh, did you have a question at the back? Yes. Okay. In the next lecture, we'll pick up from here. And I have office hours if you want to continue any discussion.